Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Lauren Gilbert. I'm the Senior Manager for Public Services at the Center for Jewish History. I oversee the Lillian Goldman Reading Room, which you can see behind me. Well, it's not actually behind me. That is a Zoom background. I'm at home, probably like most, if not all of you. I also oversee the Ackman and Ziff Genealogy Institute. I assume you're somewhat interested in genealogy because you're joining us today. So I just want to remind you to please uh, check out our weekly genealogy coffee break, which is on Facebook Live every Tuesday afternoon at 3.30 p.m., uh, presented by our two genealogy librarians. A different topic uh, every week, and you can um, watch them live Tuesdays at 3.30, or you can see them all recorded on our Facebook page after the fact. Um, we also have a genealogy program coming up next Monday at 6 p.m. Uh, Eastern Time called Jewish Refugees and the U.S.-Mexico Border, and you can sign up for that via the calendar link on our website. Just a couple of other general announcements before I introduce Libby. First of all, um, you may have seen on a slideshow that was running before the program, you can receive a signed copy of the book with a $50 or higher donation to the Center for Jewish History. And I'd like to thank the Village Bookstore in Pleasantville, New York, for working this out with us and with Libby. The page for ordering is cjh.org slash lost family. And remember, signed books make great gifts. And I know Libby is willing to uh, sign the books to a specific person, and then the bookstore can ship it wherever you like within the US. And we'll have to close off that page in a couple of days so that we can place the order with the bookstore. So please get your order in as soon as possible. We are also running uh, the summer reading schmooze at CJH this summer, where our followers and all of you send us your uh, book recommendations for summer reading picks. We'll be sharing uh, some of them on social media. And once a month at our author visit, our author talk like this one, we'll be sharing that month's winner. So congratulations to uh, Liz Clare from Austin, Texas, who is the very lucky winner of a CJH tote bag, which is already in the mail to Austin, Texas. And she wrote a great book blurb, and I'm going to read it to you. It's very short. Uh, she's recommending a book called 10 Years Gone by Jonathan Dunsky, the first of five novels featuring Israeli detective and Holocaust survivor Adam Lapide, who prowls the mean streets of Tel Aviv circa 1949. Gritty, complex, and entertaining, perfect for mystery and history lovers. Now that's a really good blurb. I'm not even much of a mystery reader, but I would definitely read that book. And I know some people who would like it a lot. Hope you're listening, Dad. It's called 10 Years Gone by Jonathan Dunsky. And please keep those recommendations coming. You can ask your questions during the talk with Libby by using the Q&A function in the Zoom. Uh, we'll get to as many of them as we can, you know, after I speak to her for probably about 45 minutes, and then we'll switch over to your questions, and I will introduce her now. Libby Copeland is an award-winning journalist and author who writes about culture, science, and human behavior. She lives in Westchester, New York, with her husband and two children. As a freelance journalist, she writes for such media outlets as The Atlantic, Slate, New York, Smithsonian, New York Times, New Republic, Esquire, and the Wall Street Journal. She was a staff reporter and editor for the Washington Post for 11 years, and she has appeared on MSNBC, CNN, and NPR as an expert on topics that she has covered, and she has been a guest speaker many times on writing and reporting. Uh, her book, The Lost Family, How DNA Testing is Upending Who We Are, was published in March by Abrams Press. The Lost Family explores the rapidly evolving phenomenon of home DNA testing, its implications for how we think about family and ourselves, and its ramifications for American culture broadly. The Wall Street Journal says it's a fascinating account of lives dramatically affected by genetic sleuthing. The New York Times writes, before you spit in that vial, read this book. Well, the Washington Post says the Lost Family reads like an Agatha Christie mystery, and wrestles with some of the biggest questions in life. Who are we? What is family? Are we defined by nature, nurture, or both? And I hope we'll get to some of those big questions today. And I'd like to thank Libby for joining us today. Thank you, Lauren, for having me. And thank you to the Center for Jewish History. I'm really delighted to be here. Well, thank you. 
I know the research for this book started with a much discussed article in the Washington Post a few years back, and I happened to read, have read that article at the time and never forgot it because it's the kind of story you really don't forget. So can you tell us, was writing that article your introduction to DNA genealogy, and how did you get from that article to this book? Yeah, great question. So it was, you know, both my parents had done some DNA testing. I had not but I had been moving more and more into the space of science writing. And so in early 2017, I had a conversation with um, my editor at the Washington Post about doing a story about DNA testing and sort of the unexpected outcomes that can result from this really fascinating growing technology. And um, and I wrote the story and I'll I'll tell a little bit about the story in, you know, in a minute, but, um, what was astonishing about the story was the response to it. So it was a a fairly lengthy sort of genetic detective mystery about the ins and outs of one woman's search. And after it ran, I got this like enormous response. I got hundreds of people emailing me saying, um, okay, that was a, a great story, but let me tell you what happened to me. You know, I did a DNA test in 2012, 2015, 2016, and this is how my life changed as a result. And as I read these stories in their totality, and there were um, different communities that were being affected by this, I was struck by the fact that this was, it seemed to me, a kind of a a profound social phenomenon, a kind of a seismic change. And the change was happening to individuals, it was happening to families, and was happening sort of broadly, culturally speaking, in America, where we've adopted this technology like no other country. And so just to give you a sense of who's affected by this, a really large category of people who are affected um, by DNA testing and who have used DNA testing for many years to find their birth families is the adoptee community, who are typically in many states um, not able to access records that would tell them about their birth families or about their own medical histories and all sorts of information that the rest of us take for granted. Uh, there's um, people who are donor conceived, who may or may not know that going in depending on when they were conceived. And sometimes are discovering a few siblings, sometimes are discovering 20, 50, even over 100 half siblings and the identities of their donor fathers. There are people who don't um, know the identities of their genetic fathers. They might think they do, and then they take a test and they discover that they didn't. Or they might go in knowing that they don't know and they use DNA to find out. And the fourth broad category of people are those for whom their genetic ancestries have been basically hidden from them. And they, they have a lot of reconciliation and soul searching to do with the circumstances under which those things were hidden and why. So DNA testing is basically a, a history lesson for all of us. It's, it's astonishing. Uh, and it was in reading all these stories and being moved by them and, and the stories of reconciliations and also rifts, s- stories with um, happy endings and stories with not so happy endings, that I, I realized I wanted to write a book about identity, about how our identities are being, are being shifted and causing, we're, you know, we're looking deeply inside ourselves and coming to understand ourselves and the past better as a result of this, this tremendous technology. Um, so you talk about how more than 30 million Americans have so far taken a home DNA test and that we've reached some kind of tipping point. So can you talk about what some of the implications are for that? Yeah. So. 30 million Americans. So what that means is that increasingly, as a bioethicist put it to me, you don't get to opt out. So that means that if there's a genetic secret in your family, it's going to come out probably. It's not a matter of if, but when, unless it already has come out. You don't need to test in order for something to be um, revealed that is very important to you. So For instance, um, because we share genetic segments, my decision to test could affect um, a brother, for instance, or even um, a nephew or a niece or um, my own parent or even a cousin, a second or a third cousin, depending. So increasingly, I think uh, DNA testing is a technology we all need to be talking about whether or not we choose to test because we share we share genetic segments, we share stories, we share experiences with our families. And so there are difficult conversations that are being having that are being had like all over the country right now as a result of DNA testing or in anticipation of it. And I'll, I'll just give you a sense. Um, 
there's a slide that we have, and we might be able to put it up here. Yeah, and I should thank uh, Ty Marks, who's the librarian who works with me in the reading room, who her camera is off, but that's her behind our logo, and she's helping us out with some of the logistics today and the slides. Right. Thank you, Ty. Ty, um, thank you so much. And so this image, which you can see, um, is from a paper um, by Razib Khan and David Middleman, who are scientists, and they are looking at the rise in recreational DNA testing from 2013 to 2018. And if this chart were to continue to now, you would see that it, um, the growth slows somewhat. But this is an absolutely astonishing rise to go from, I think approximately 1 million all together, if you were to combine the databases, somewhere around 2013, 2014, to, to those numbers for 2018 to now, we're at, we're at a little over 30 million. You know, I, <laughs> it has gone from something that was in the very beginnings of the industry started in 2000, exactly 20 years ago. And in the very beginning, it was a niche product for family historians. It was seen as, you know, just augmenting genealogy, but it wasn't really seen in more broad terms. And it has gone from that to a, a broad cultural phenomenon. People buy these as, um, you know, holiday gifts. I think, I think my first DNA test I've taken three was gifted to me from my fa from my father for the holidays in late 2016, and that's how many people purchase it. Many people purchase it without necessarily knowing what it's going to tell them. They might not even know that they're going to get a list of genetic relatives. Um, they might just be thinking about that pie chart. The advertising money that's been spent on this industry is is something else. Uh, and so this has become, um, you know, a fun gift for the person who already has everything in your life. And then, of course, sometimes the implications of that gift can be just absolutely profound. Yeah, it's interesting that something that's just, you know, as you said, just, a, you know, a fun holiday gift for the person who has anything can completely overturn your right. identity and conception of your family. So your story, your book is, is sort of framed around the story of uh, Alice Collins' um, Playbook. Um, so, and I don't want to spoil the story because it really does read like a mystery. So, trying to avoid spoilers as much as possible, um, could you explain why her singular quest provides such a powerful window uh, into home DNA testing? Yeah. So, Alice is a wonderful person. She tested back in 2012, really at the dawn of um, autosomal DNA testing. Um, Ancestry, a company that would later become the biggest player on the scene, had just unveiled its test and it was in beta. So Alice, and we can bring up a picture of her here, she tests in 2012, the test is in beta, she's an early adopter, she's a brilliant woman who has worked in technology, she's very, very analytical mind. So she's worked her whole career in technology and information processing and understanding how to um, organize data. And um, she's just retired, she takes this test and she is expecting a pie chart that is almost entirely Irish and British Isles based on her understanding of her family. Instead, what she gets is a pie chart that is basically split down the middle. One half is Irish and British Isles, and the other half is Ashkenazi Jewish. And she's a genealogist. She's researched her family history. She doesn't understand how this can be, and she first assumes that ancestry has messed up. You know, their test is still being tested out. So um, she emails them and she says, hey, you guys, you know, you don't, your science isn't up to snuff yet. You know, you gave me the wrong results. And of course, like so many Americans who would come after her, you know, it, it would turn out that it was she who had her family history wrong through no fault of her own, um, and the test was right. And her parents were gone by that point, right? Her parents were gone, and she had to go through this methodical process of understanding how this could be. And ultimately getting, there's, there's seven Collins siblings. Um, they were raised Irish-American Catholic, and um, ultimately all of them would put their DNA into databases so that Alice and her sister could basically... You could think about it like a quilt. They had to like pick apart the threads of the quilt to really understand how they had come to be. And they spent two and a half years immersed in um, basically building databases of their own DNA in order to understand through um, genetic connections with distant relatives whose names they didn't recognize, you know, what their, what their story was, what the, what the answer to their genetic mystery was. 
the reason I wanted to tell Alice's story as the sort of main narrative of The Lost Family is because her story provides an incredible window on other people's stories. I mentioned earlier, you know, when I wrote that Washington Post story, I got a lot of emails from people telling me their stories. What I'm allowed, what I'm allowed to do by telling Alice's story is sort of tell her story. And as she's going, she's basically got theory after theory to explain how she, you know, how she got her story wrong. So one theory, for instance, is that she is the product of an NPE which stands for non-paternity event or not parent expected. That is the most common explanation for this kind of result. And it would have been um, not terribly shocking and out of the blue if that had been her explanation, but it wasn't. So as I'm telling her theories and dismissing them one after one, it gives me the opportunity to also tell, you know, give you a sense of what it does look like from the perspective of a person who does discover that they're the product of an NPE. And I had many of those stories from people who had emailed me, and then I had reported my way toward them. She dismisses all the sort of more, more common explanations that she's adopted, that she's an NPE, that her people hid their um, Jewish identity and pretended to be Irish or had it hidden from them. She kind of goes through all these, and I explore what all these different scenarios look like. Um, and at the end of the day, I won't tell you what happened, but there's a, a really evocative image that, that perhaps Ty can pull up. Um, and it's an old photograph that's about 100 years old. And it is, you can see there's three children and they're sitting on a man's lap. And this was a photograph that had been in Alice's possession. And she had to understand how the circumstances came together to create this image. Like, how did the people come to be in this portrait? that wound up being the key to her um, sort of solving her mystery. And it took her two and a half years to, um, to unravel the, the century old mystery. Yeah, well, I would like to get back to Alice in a little bit, but you mentioned something called uh, NPEs, uh, non-paternity events or not parent expected. And clearly they're common enough to have their own, you know, common abbreviation. And they're naturally, you know, shocking to those affected by them and fascinating to us. Um, so how, com how common are they? Or have you figured that out through your research? Yeah, that's a good question. So I conservatively estimate that about a million out of the more than 30 million people who've tested experience either an NPE or discover that they have a sibling or half sibling they didn't know about. I've seen estimates that are higher. My estimate is something like 3%. I've seen estimates that are 15%. Um, Pew did a study that they found about 27% of people who tested discovered unexpected relatives. That's a very broad definition with a very high outcome. I think the important thing to remember is if you're looking at a million people who've discovered one of these two outcomes, that's really just a fraction of the story. Why is that? because there are other kinds of things that you can uncover that aren't encapsulated by this sort of these two categories. So for instance, I tell the story of a woman named Linda who discovers she's adopted by undertaking a DNA test. You know, the discovery that you have 22 siblings through the same donor father is um, sort of a separate category. I tell that story in the book as well. And the other thing to consider is that every time somebody makes a discovery through DNA testing, that discovery doesn't just belong to them. It belongs to the family that they grew up with. It belongs to their genetic kin. Um, in the case of Linda, the adoptee, her um, understanding of herself that she had been adopted, you know, a conclusion she came to after spitting into a vial, that affects her relationship with her mother and her brothers. It also affects the family that she reached out to on her, on her biological mother's side and the family on her biological father's side. So you have, in that instance, maybe 10 people at least who are impacted by a single, the single act of one person spitting into a tube. So you're really talking about millions of Americans who are impacted by this kind of discovery. Um, yeah, you do tell a lot of stories in your book about um, the recipients of these secrets and how they respond to them, both the seeker as well as the person who's found. It's the person who did not go looking for this information. Right. Um, can you tell us a little more about that? Yeah, I mean, these, these stories were sort of the heart of the reporting that I did, um, and they were the most moving. Um, they could be incredibly hopeful. Sometimes I found myself crying on the phone with the person I was talking to because they could be really, really heartbreaking. 
Um, I actually just wrote a column that came out today on Psychology Today about all the different ways that can play out and sort of like what things can help you anticipate how a reunion might play out and why genetic relatives want or don't want to, um, to make contact with one another. You know, I found stories of men, for instance, who had discovered they had genetic children or maybe knew and, um, you know, maybe didn't admit it to themselves or weren't open about it. Um, I found stories where they absolutely flatly rejected their adult genetic children. Um, in one instance, a man just, he had a phone conversation with his daughter. And then after that, he just deleted his kit and turned down any more contact. In the case of Linda, the adoptee, who she reached out to and had multiple conversations with her father, he told her at one point that these conversations were getting him in trouble with his wife. And at a certain point, he had his attorney send her basically a letter saying, like, stop contacting my client. Mm -hmm. So those stories are kind of pretty heartbreaking. At the same time, there are quite wonderful stories of men embracing um, their children. And there's one story that I tell in the book about a man named Jeff who um, is living with ALS, which is a really, you know, degenerative disease that had, by the time I talked to him, you know, all but destroyed his ability to talk. So we actually communicated by email and he would type by way of a wireless mouse that was connected to a headset, like basically connected to his glasses. He could type that way. And he told me his story of discovering um, the, the daughter that he'd conceived in high school. He had not known about her and she reached out to him. And he at first thought that this was a scam because she contacted him on Facebook. But when he signed into Ancestry, he saw no, she was indeed quite real. And she, you know, it said parent-child relationship right, right there on Ancestry. And he told me that what he had learned through living with this, basically this death sentence over his head for decades was that guilt and shame are wasteful emotions and that none of us have time to waste. So because of his profound belief um, in, in gratitude and because of his religious beliefs, he was able to accept his daughter into his life with, um, you know, with open arms and with great joy. And that story to me, I just, I found incredibly moving and there are many other stories like that. So it's a bit of a roulette wheel, honestly. Um, people don't know what they're going to get. They don't know what the circumstances are for the, the people on the other side. Sometimes there's pain and trauma. Sometimes there's um, instances where a woman conceived a child and it wasn't, it was through, you know, violence, sexual coercion, um, it, you know, rape. And, um, you know, so these are really, really painful circumstances. And it's, it's, it's certainly the case that most people I talked to who discovered something fundamental about their own origins were glad to know, um, but it is not always the case for the people on the other side. And, and everyone sort of gets to define how they feel about this technology and how they're going to, how they're going to handle it coming out perhaps decades, decades later, you know, decades after the fact. Yeah. I was really surprised about the cases in which like that sort of, shame or stigma from decades ago, you would feel, you feel like maybe that wouldn't come into play so much anymore, but there are families that just can't, can't move on to the detriment right. of the poor person seeking their family and to be right. rejected. Um, just to that, to that point, I think that's really good because like, that's a good point because we live now right in this culture of um, less stigma about certain things that used to be stigmatized. And we're also living in a kind of a culture of transparency and authenticity and you speak your own truth. And that really butts up with the culture of the past, which is like another country. One thing I found is that when there's a secret that's maintained in a family, the secret, the secret kind of is sticky, I guess you could say. Like it, it, it kind of um, acquires the weight of, of stone. And even when circumstances change, like um, maybe 50 years have passed, that secret still has its its power and it is so difficult to turn that around and suddenly begin having a, a conversation with your spouse to say, listen, this is what happened before we were married or this is what happened in the early years of our marriage. It's, it's a really profound moment of reckoning that we're having right in this moment with history. Um, so back to Alice for a little bit. 
in exploring an Ashkenazi Jewish heritage as Alice did, can you talk about some of the unique complexities with home DNA testing or special implications for the Jewish community? At one yeah. point, you talked about something called, um, I don't know, remember if you were quoting somebody, Ashkenazi Jewish endogamous spaghetti. So what is yeah. that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and I, I'm half Ashkenazi Jewish, so I've seen this myself with my results. So there are communities that are endogamous, meaning, you know, there's a lot of marriage, um, sometimes between cousins over a long period of time within a close knit community. And it's not just Ashkenazi Jews, but it's other communities that that also share this characteristic. And what this means is that it's very difficult to unravel one's connection. So when, when you take a DNA test, you pay your 99 bucks and you spit into a vial, you get your ethnicity chart and you get your list of genetic relatives. And typically it'll say, you know, it might say parent, child, it might say sibling, half sibling, cousin, first, second, third cousin, third to fifth. For a lot of people who don't come from endogamous backgrounds, that information is pretty reliable. But when you're Ashkenazi Jewish, it's not always so reliable because somebody might look like a closer cousin than they truly are. They might look like a second or a third cousin when they're really a more distant cousin several times over. And that's because you're related, you're de very distantly related to that person along multiple channels, right? You're, you're over related to them. You're related to them in more than one way. And the system interprets all those tiny little broken up genetic overlapping genetic segments as a greater relationship than it actually is. So for Alice to try and tease that apart, that's why it took her two and a half years. And she had to build, you know, a database and use all these spreadsheets because she was trying to understand she had so ma very many sibling, uh, so very many cousins and this, the, she was looking at all herself and all six of her siblings and all of their cousins. And she was examining the little segments, you know, measured in, in cent organs um, <laughs> along rows. It was an astonishing feat. I mean, it, it, that she was able to do this is absolutely extraordinary. <laughs> Are there other um, groups in which this is the common issue, the endogamy? Yeah, um, yeah, there's, I believe, French Cajuns, I believe, um, Amish. Um, there's, a, there's a number of communities. If you look it up, there's six or seven, at least, that are in the United States that have experienced something like this. You mentioned that this year marks the 20th anniversary of home DNA testing. So, I mean, that's a very extraordinary milestone. Um, Could you yeah. tell us a little how the industry started? Yeah, so the industry starts in 2000. It actually starts in the late 90s. Um, there's a man named Bennett Greenspan. You may have heard of him. He's the founder of a company called Family Tree DNA, which is the oldest genealogy, you know, ancestry genealogy te DNA testing company um, in the U.S. And he was an entrepreneur, sort of in early retirement, and a genealogist and was very, very curious to solve a particular mystery within his own family tree that he could not figure out how to solve. It was his brick wall. And he decided that if he could do a DNA test, it would all you know, potentially become clear. So he actually calls up this scientist at the University of Arizona who we knew had been studying um, Y DNA, which is you know the, the, the chromosome, the Y chromosome gets passed down from father to son to father to son. And, and, and this was early DNA testing. So the kind of DNA test that you can take now, autosomal wasn't available. And he calls up the scientist and he says like, I wanna buy a DNA test from you. And the guy's like, we don't really do that. And out of that conversation was born this idea Greenspan had this idea that maybe there were other people out there like him who also wanted to, you know, use this to augment their family history research. And he started the company back in 2000. And he told me that in the beginning, I, I flew down to Texas to interview him. And he said in the beginning, you know, he would go to these genealogy conferences and he'd be trying to explain to people, hey, I've got this DNA test. And he, you know, they were not responsive. They did not understand how this was going to help them. He would try to take them. He would, he would talk really fast. He would shake their hand. He would walk backwards, holding their hand, trying to get them over to his little cubicle so that he could actually show them what it was all about. And, um, you know, I guess in the very beginning, it was so incredibly niche. 
He ran that business for, um, you know, he's still in the business 20 years on, but there was, a, it was about 10 years where he was pretty much the only player in town. 23andMe was there, but they weren't really, um, they were mostly focused on health. And, and now, you know, this industry in the last 10 years or so has really, has really blown up. Uh, as you say, back in the beginning, it was this like really niche thing and hard to, you know, understand or explain and of course, Alice, as you mentioned, was a computer scientist and data obsessed, mm -hmm. as were some of her siblings. And it seems to me this she could not have unraveled her story otherwise. So when you talk a little bit about how that has changed, how it used to be necessary to have this very analytical mind to really understand this stuff compared to now, and are we running out of mysteries to solve? Is everything going to be instantaneously right. available? Yeah, that's such a great question. So uh, Alice could solve her mystery now maybe in a matter of weeks or days. Um, and that's because the databases are so big. And so what that means is there's a much, much greater chance if you test now than if you tested, say, five years ago, that you're going to find a close cousin who is going to make it very easy for you to unravel. You know, Alice was dealing with very distant cousins. She was building all these family trees going back and then trying to, um, you know, understand most recent common ancestors. When you're dealing with third and fourth cousins, that's a it's a very difficult job. And, you know, nowadays, many people who are seekers, they set out looking for genetic family, they might find a half sibling, they might find a first cousin, they might find an, an aunt very, very quickly. And um, I do think that this is the era when, you know, genetic secrets basically come to a close. And um, I don't think that we will... Um, regard it the same way in the future. I think that parents will have different conversations with their children in terms of having, you know, in terms of transparency about how they came into the world just by necessity. Um, because when so many people have, have been DNA tested, the whole population in many ways is kind of drawn into the technology. Uh, you say that anonymous sperm donor is now an oxymoron, right? Um, and clearly... Yeah. So home DNA testing impacts some community more than others, donor conceived, adoptees. Um, can you say a little more about that? Yeah, I mean, you know, there's a reason why um, certain communities started using this technology sooner than others. And it's because they realized the potential to, to you know, get around roadblocks to their own identity. And it's incredibly important for people to understand their own origins. I think of it like, it's kind of like telling your story, right? We all have a narrative of ourselves. However we, however we articulate it to ourselves, we all kind of carry a narrative. And if you don't have your own beginning, it's very difficult to tell the rest of the story. Over and over when I was talking to people who were seeking, um, and I broadly refer to, to this category of seekers in my book, people who are looking for answers about themselves, or their own past um, through through DNA testing, they they used very common language to describe the experience: a sense of rootlessness, a sense of dislocation, a, oh, just an, a profound yearning to understand where they came from. And once they understood where they came from, whether or not it led to a happy reunion with family or not they had a sense often of rootedness, the they, they, sense that they knew exactly where on this earth they belonged. And they had a kind of a perspective, a sense of orientation. Um, I, I actually, I mean, I, I think psychologists need to probably study this, you know, as a phenomenon, there's been some research on it, um, but, but now with DNA testing, I think there's an opportunity to really look at the common language and the common experiences around that desire to understanding your own to understand your own origins. It's really it's really interesting. Did you talk to some anybody who was sorry they learned what they learned because the outcome was not happy, or were they always glad to know the truth? It's really interesting. So over and over, the people who had agency in the process were glad to know, and that was even in instances when like the truth was like really painful. Um, but they were able to see, you know, very often, for instance, if they had a loving relationship with their father and they discovered that some other person had, you know, had given them half their genetic material, not the man they considered dad, but somebody else, a stranger. They were very, 
very often almost always able to kind of open up to both, right? Like there's, there's, there's two fathers. So there's an inclusive inclusiveness of language there, which is kind of like the expansion of, of the family. Agency is very important because when you are, you are the person who's spitting into the tube, you're the one making decisions, you're the one invested, you're the one deciding on the timeline. When people have the news thrust upon them, or when you are, the, say, the keeper of a secret, um, for whatever reasons, however, very, very valid when that decision was made, and there are many circumstances in which it made a great deal of sense, especially for women, to not talk about, say, a child that they'd had before they were married. Those people on the other side who are experiencing that come out, maybe not when, at exactly when they're ready, that can be, that can be very difficult. So I, you, as you were saying, this DNA genealogy home testing only started about 20 years ago and really took off more recently than that. Can you talk about how it has changed genealogy as a hobby? I think what's interesting, and you see this in the second half of the 20th century, that um, genealogy becomes more and more mainstream. You see um, the rise of the computer, internet, social media, and of course, all the um, subscription, subscription services at Ancestry, the, the free archival materials at FamilySearch, um, you can subscribe at MyHeritage. There's this incredible growth in one's ability to research and DNA augments that. And it's also kind of a backdoor for people who are not that interested in family history and they become a genealogist. They kind of fall down that rabbit hole. And I talk a little bit about that in the book too, this obsessive quality. And you're like, oh my gosh, there's so much in the records. You're putting each one of us becomes a bit of a detective, putting the pieces together, going farther and farther back. It's pretty astonishing. So, so yeah, I think DNA, you know, DNA augments genealogy. Genealogy is what led to the popularity of DNA. They kind of work hand in hand. Um, so the um, traditional archivally based genealogy, um, you know, relies on records that were kept and saved and preserved. So. So the people who were privileged by history tend to be the people who are now privileged by the records. So, you know, if your ancestors were enslaved or, you're, or they hailed from a destroyed shtetl town, you're less likely to be reflected in the official record, you know, maintained by the powers that be. So in this way, it seems DNA um, genealogy is, is democratizing. So yes. has this upended traditional genealogy in some way? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, genealogists are always talking about their brick walls and DNA is just so powerful in terms of its ability to allow people to break through those brick walls. The past is so immediate when you use DNA testing. Um, you don't need to rely on those records. And, and as, I mean, you do use the records, of course, to augment the DNA. It's not as if you can only rely on DNA. You need, you need both, ideally, if you have it. But particularly for people whose past have been denied to them because of war, because of um, poverty, because of illiteracy, because of the slave trade. This allows them access to understanding who they, you know, who they are, who their people are. And in that way, it's kind of like, it is democratizing and it's kind of like a revelatory force. You know, it shines light and you can see. And, and, and I, that I, I find absolutely amazing, the, the way that it brings the past forward to the present and suddenly you feel like, oh, this isn't all so long ago at all, you know? Um, one thing I hadn't thought a lot about before reading your book was how wrapped up in eugenics, both um, the history of genetics and as a result, genealogy have been historically speaking. So can you talk to us a little bit about the racist history of these fields? Yeah, I needed to go back um, to the sort of beginnings of um, genetics and also the history of genealogy in this country to understand sort of where we are now, to set the scene, to give it context. Um, so in the early days of the genetics field in the early 1900s, it was very, very intertwined with eugenics. You know, this belief that you could better the race, um, that certain people were better than others, um, that there was a kind of an inherent higher value to certain people. And this was like common. This was, it was taken up by um, progressive reformers as a means of making, you know, Americans better. It wasn't, um, it wasn't like marginal in the early 1900s. 
and so this led to um, forced sterilizations. It led to, it had an influence on immigration law. There were, um, there was this concept of eugenic love that, um, that it was believed that you could make love and marriage more scientific by pushing people in the right direction in terms of who they married. There were better babies contests across the United States at state fairs where babies would be judged and given points or have points taken away depending on how they rated. So if a baby had like scaly skin or delayed teeth development, they might have like points taken away. So this was like across the culture. And, you know, why does that matter? It, it matters so much because when scientists and social scientists now talk about um, genetic difference and talk about uh, what you can tell in the genes and what you can't, um, they're very, very conscious of this history and for good reason. Because, um, because A, there's a danger to genetic determinism, to sort of reading too much into the genes and what they can, and how, you know, how much fate they can predict. But also, um, when it has to do with race and difference, you know, we are products of our culture and science is shaped by culture. And so um, we need to know that it is possible for us to see what we want to see or what we assume in science and sort of shape the science to be in keeping with assumptions about essential inferiority and superiority. Um, and that's an incredibly cautionary thing to think about when we're engaging with genetic testing and we're getting pie charts that tells what our ethnicity is to think very carefully about what we, what we mean when we talk about um, genetics and race and, 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 and ethnicity. Um, so this tipping point you spoke about earlier, we've already seen some other dramatic implications like solving cold case murders, um, the Golden State Killer, for example. And I know most of us have heard about that case without necessarily understanding how that happened and how genetic genealogy actually solved the case and uncovered the killer. So if you could talk to us a little bit about that, as well as sort of the legal and ethical implications about using test results that were taken for, you know, recreational genealogy, family history, and then using them to solve crimes. Right. Okay. Great questions. Um, so, and the Golden State Killer case happened just about two years ago, a little over, and apparently on Monday, the reports are that he, there's going to be a hearing and he's going to plead guilty. So that's interesting um, because sort of the case that started all of this is now coming, it's now coming full circle, excuse me. Basically what happened was that this was a kind of a novel use of, um, of you know, genetic genealogy databases, but it was not unlike what um, many seekers, the ways in which they had been using their DNA for, for, very, for many, very many years. What happened in this instance is that law enforcement took crime scene DNA, they used a genetic genealogist to help them, and they put it in a kind of a quasi-public database called GEDmatch, um, which is still being used now to, to solve cold crimes along with other um, databases. Um, and they were able to find relatives for that, that crime scene DNA. So they were able to find people who had put their DNA in there for recreational purposes to understand their you know, family histories. And they were able to say, oh, it's third cousin, fourth cousin, and they were able to build back to most recent common ancestors and then do reverse genealogy forward and look at um, the, the descendants and then figure out based on how the sort of DNA fit and the demographics and other things, they were able to figure out who the suspect was and then take, basically take something that he had discarded. You know, in this case, it's usually like a straw or a tissue or something else that has DNA on it that's discarded in a public place. And they were able to compare that to the DNA in their system and make a match and then make an arrest. And now it's been used in over a hundred cases. Um, there are privacy concerns about it, although the original sort of clamor that you heard back in 2018 has certainly died down from what I can tell. Um, and there's um, been some polling among Americans that Americans seem to be mostly on board with this in the most egregious cases. Um, but there are privacy experts who are concerned about, um, you know, overreach, about surveillance, about the idea that this is, um, you know, overstepping and sort of threatening the Fourth Amendment and um, basically, you know, amounts to fishing expeditions to catch up people who would never otherwise be suspects. 
and yet um, it hasn't really been tested in a court. So, um, you know, it's hard to say whether those legal arguments would succeed. So you tell the story of a woman who tracked down a half brother through like this dogged detective genealogy research, formed a strong bond with him and then discovered through DNA testing that they weren't, you know, genetically related after all. So it's the so she found him through genealogy and then lost him through DNA. And that was a pretty moving story because they still maintain this incredibly strong bond, even though they were, it wasn't a genetic bond as they, you know, as they found out and considered themselves true family. So I think that's kind of important when we sort of fall into, you know, biology is destiny, that um, DNA is not love, you know. And um, yeah. I did a book discussion last week on Danny Shapiro's inheritance and she discovered through DNA, te DNA testing that she was donor conceived. And there's a really touching scene where she confronts her father who has died, but his very elderly sister, and she's afraid that the aunt will, you know, reject her as not being her, related to her anymore. And she said something like, you know, I'm not giving you up. Mm, so, yeah. So do you feel like um, DNA testing is sort of expanding, you know, how we think about family and is the nuclear family expanding? Yeah, yeah, I do. I mean, I do. I mean, it, people understand this on a, on a visceral level that family is neither one nor the other, just as genetics are incredibly important in understanding your origins, experience, intention, love, a lifetime of memories with someone. Those are not undone. Um, by a DNA test. And, um, you know, I, I, I can't think of a single person I interviewed who, you know, didn't still include in their heart and in their lives, you know, those people who had, they had understood to be genetic related to them, even when it turned out that they weren't. And, and even to cases where a kind of a late in life reconciliation with someone that later was turned out that person was not genetically related. Those bonds are real too. Those bonds hang on. Um, I tell the story in a book of a woman who found um, the person she thought was her sister because she was mistakenly reunited with this woman through a um, social services agency in Los Angeles County. And a year later took a DNA test and she wasn't related to that woman. It turned out they're still sisters. They consider themselves sisters. They call each other sister after one year of bonding because of the experiences that they shared, um, commonalities in their childhood, their personalities, they chose that. Mm -hmm. And um, I do really think that DNA testing is encouraging us to think in less binary terms about how we define family and be more inclusive, you know, inclusive and ex expansive about those bonds. Let me end with this question before we open it up to the questions in the Q&A. So given everything that you've learned, um, what advice do you have for people who are thinking of taking a home DNA test? So, you know, I think that, um, you know, most people who test will um, discover that things are in line with what they expect. Many of them will find that, that you know, they have access to the past in a way they never otherwise would have. And that is really, really a cool thing. And it, and it, and it has been in my family. Um, and there's a significant minority of people who are going to discover something that isn't what they expect. Um, and so, you know, people do perhaps have to have to kind of acknowledge that. I mean, in my experience, um, the warnings that the companies give you that, you know, you may discover unexpected relatives, people don't generally think that's going to happen to them even when it's statistically possible. So the warnings kind of fall on deaf ears. I mean, why would you expect something like that? Um, I think there's a category of people who are concerned about privacy issues that are separate and apart from, from these questions of family. And for those people, I say, um, you know, heed those concerns because I wouldn't want to be in a position of telling you to take a test and, you know, without knowing what happens to that data 20, 30, 40 years down the line, um, if it were to happen that this data is used in a way you don't want, um, you know, I wouldn't want to have to be responsible. So increasingly, I think the thinking is, and I hear this from genetic genealogists as well, that if somebody is hesitating, you don't push them to do it. If they don't want to do it, there might be a reason. It might be in their family. It might be concerns about privacy. That is to be respected. And for the rest of us, you know, I think 
as I've said earlier, you know, increasingly it doesn't matter if you test. If there are secrets in your family, they're going to come out. So maybe this is more the moment to think about having those difficult conversations. If you happen to be um, a parent in possession of a secret about your child, maybe they were donor conceived and you haven't told them, this might be the moment to start thinking about whether that's a conversation you need to have now before they spit into a vial. Um, great, thank you. Um, I'm looking into the Q&A and there's a question about DNA being used to solve crimes, which I think we covered. Um, somebody wants to know, are there some types or products of DNA testing that are better for endogamous genealogy? Good question. Um, I think, you know, generally speaking, if, you're, um, if you've got a genetic genealogist advising you, they'll tell you to look at um, segment size. So the larger the segment, um, usually typically the greater the relationship and that can be a way to weed out endogamous results and so a company that doesn't um, give you those tiny little short little segments that can be a little bit um, more helpful but in general for people the larger the database you know the easier it is find genetic kin and so you can look at the database sizes and you can make a determination about about that um, it will still vary from community to community somewhat but generally speaking, if the database is bigger, you have just a better shot at finding family, if that's what you're looking for. Um, somebody's asking how the testing companies get the information on your genetic relatives who have not been tested by them. So if you want to explain a little bit how that works, or yeah, how, no. how you can track down somebody who has not been tested. Right, so it's not as if I can find my aunt in the system if she hasn't tested, right? But maybe my uncle tested. So, <laughs> Basically, the process that genetic genealogy, ge genetic genealogists engage in or search angels or people who are seeking is a process of filling in the blanks. So you might not be able to find um, the person you're looking for, but maybe that person's sister has tested. And then with the advantages of being able to build a family tree with the information that's available online, maybe on social media, you can look for can you know you can trace up and find a most recent recent common ancestor and you can kind of trace down so basically what you're looking it at is you're searching for the closest possible relationship and then you're trying to understand how you're related to that person it's a bit of um fitting puzzle pieces together i don't think it's it, it depends on the relationship if it's a more distant cousin it can be extremely challenging and you have to have um an ability to do genealogy in order to understand it but it's not as if you're able to see people who've never tested. It's more that you can see someone who has tested and then you can kind of fill in the blanks with the advantages of archival materials that allow you to build a family tree and then the benefits of the internet and social media that allow you to see relatives. So people who are doing this are steeped in obituaries, right? They're reading about, um, they might be using people search, they might be using white pages once they've figured out exactly what branch they're trying to research. Um, I see a, a specific genealogy question from Jeff. Jeff, please email gi at cjh.org for your question. I don't know if you can answer this one, but uh, Jacqueline wants to know, how has DNA testing affected the issue of who is a Jew? Oh, goodness. That's a really interesting question. I know there's been um, a lot of sort of debate about this in Israel, which I've followed with half a brain. And so I won't talk about that because I'll probably get something wrong. But I, I, can kind of, I can kind of speak about this in personal terms, um, which is that I think what's struck me in since doing DNA testing is that we are very selective in our identities and we've always been that way. We were there, we were that way before DNA and we're that way now. So, um, you know, there's a certain amount of experience that goes into play with how you interpret your ethnic identity. If you grow up with the practices of your Greek father and very little influence from um, your Swedish mother, um, you think of yourself as Greek, even though your pie chart says something different, right? And so for me, you know, I'm half Ashkenazi Jewish on my mother's side. I identify that way, but not because it's through my mother. And not because, you know, I love my parents differently. Like I adore both of my parents, right? But it was because she was the one who gave us that ethnic identity, that culture when we were growing up. It's just, it's just the way it was. My dad gave us many, many other things. And so 
I, again, uh, you know, I talked a little earlier about family and this idea of inclusiveness. I think and I hope that DNA testing is, is giving us also a less binary relationship to ethnic identity, right? More of a sense of something we've always known, which is that it's not one or the other, it's both. It's yes and. Yes, I am this because of experience. Oh, and also, wow, I found out I'm also this from this DNA test, and now I'm going to find out more about that. And that's real. But, but what you grow up with is also quite real. Um, and, um, you know, I think that's hopeful, actually. Um, could you address any ability of DNA to break through the brick wall created by the Holocaust? Families in Eastern European shtetl who, along with their records, simply disappeared. Yes, um, a little bit, although the people who would be expert in this are on Facebook um, and there's, um, you know, a number of genetic genealogy um, for Jews Facebook groups that um, you could turn to. But certainly um, I can, again, speak about this for me, you know, my mother's um, grandfather came over well, well before the Holocaust, never spoke of his family that we left behind, and we had assumed that there was nobody left. And we were able to find just recently a second cousin to my mother who was born in Ukraine. So this is a branch of the family that survived World War II. They survived everything that happened before. They survived, I, you know, I imagine pogroms. I imagine, um, you know, World War II and, and growing up in, you know, the Soviet Union. And we didn't have a paper trail of what happened to that branch of the family. And we would literally not know that they existed, but for this. So, I mean, there are, there are other stories. There's a wonderful genetic genealogist named Jennifer Mendelson who tells stories about her husband's family and how they were able to make connections to people lost, um, supposedly lost during the Holocaust, but not. And so, um, and she's somebody who has a lot of wisdom that you could look up, Jennifer Mendelson. Um, but yes, I mean, there, there, are, there are these incredibly hopeful stories. And, um, uh, and, and so, yeah, I think that's, that's, that's pretty amazing. Um, Jennifer will be doing a, a Zoom program with us probably in August. So look out. Oh, for great. That. Yeah, she's, she's really smart. Um, so uh, Jessica is asking, does all final DNA testing information go into one database or do the test companies share with one another? And That's, what a great, that's a great question. Sharing? Yeah, so they're separate. So Ancestry DNA has about 16 million people in it. 23andMe has about 10. My Heritage has, I think, four. And Family Tree DNA, which is the oldest, has between one and two million people. They do not share. And um, they do not generally, the bigger ones generally don't share, by the way, um, access to law enforcement who are investigating cold cases, with the exception of family tree DNA. And there's, you can look into that. There's opt-in and opt-out rules. So you can, you can join their database and opt out of that use. But there, there are um, bright lines between them. So if I test in Ancestry and you're, and you're related to me and you test in 23andMe, we won't be able to find each other. And that's why um, some people test in multiple places. And, and that's also why you had some people downloading their information and uploading it to GEDmatch, this quasi public database, which was how the Golden State Killer was caught because it was sort of an open, kind of an open database that people from different companies could um, upload their information to. Uh, Jean says, you mentioned that 30 million in the US have done some type of DNA testing. Uh, how common is it in different parts of the world, particularly Eastern Europe and places where Ashkenazi Jewish people have lived? Yeah, so um, if you look at the countries that are interested in this or that have been doing this, um, it's the US, Canada, um, the UK, Australia. It's not so much other parts of the world. You know, you see some in Western Europe. I don't actually know what the numbers are for Eastern Europe, but when I looked at the list of countries that were most commonly testing, there was nothing from Eastern Europe on there. So, you know, trying to find someone that way, I think, hoping that someone may have tested, I think that's, that's super challenging. Um, and Nina is asking, how did you find the people you discuss in your book, especially Alice, or how did they find you? Great, great question. So Alice's story was first told to me by a genetic genealogist named C.C. Moore, who some of you may have heard of. 
And um, then I reached out to Alice and, um, and got to know her. Many of the people in my book I found after I wrote that Washington Post article, I think there was like 400 emails and I just started reading them and writing people back. And some of them were people that I wanted to put in the book. And then there were other stories, there were very specific stories that I was looking for that I kind of reported my way. I would, I would talk to a genetic genealogist or talk to a search angel and I would say, um, I'm looking for somebody who's experienced X, Y, Z, or I need more input from people, you know, from this community. And I would find people that way. Maybe we could have time for um, one more question. Uh, from Diane, how accepting is the medical and psychological community of consumer DNA tests? And what is your sense of how well they respond to or communicate with patients or clients who have done consumer DNA tests? Hmm, that's a good question. Well, medical and psychological are a bit different. Um, medical, from what I have heard, you know, it's a bit challenging for doctors to interpret the results of recreational DNA testing. So, you know, as most people know, you know, there are companies increasingly more and more of the companies are offering health related testing in addition to finding your genetic relatives, but these tests are not comprehensive and they can be difficult for somebody to interpret on their own. And some of the companies offer sort of like to hold your hand a bit more and, and some of them don't. And so there are cases of people sort of taking their say 23 me results to their to their doctor and their doctor saying, well, you know, uh, what, I can't do anything with this or we need to have more tests or, you know, I'm not sure what this means. Um, and um, so, so that can be a bit challenging. So the question about psychologists, I think that there's actually a great need for the mental health community to recognize um, this seismic shock that's taking place across American family after family. I think that I know of three or four psychologists who are starting to specialize in this. I think in the future, there's going to be way more. I think there's going to be study of, um, you know, the commonalities of language, which I mentioned earlier, you know, the people's desires to know their genetic origins. And, and also importantly, people on the other side, how they handle this, you know, people who are being sought out, who might not be wanting to be sort, sought out in some cases. How do you foster reconciliation? How do you mediate those situations? There's a lot of um, sometimes beautiful and reconciliatory, but sometimes really painful conversations happening across America right now. And it's happening without a lot of formal support. There's Facebook groups for people who want to support each other. And those are great. And also I think, we'll need at some point in the future professionals as well. Well, this has been really wonderful. Thank you so much. I'd like to remind uh, everyone watching, you can order a signed copy of the book at cjh.org slash lost family. So you get a copy of the book and you get to donate to CJH so we can continue to do programs like this. So thank you very much everyone else for joining us and we'll see you next time. Thanks Libby. Thank you so much, Lauren. I appreciate Take it. Care.